Uh, today I'll be talking um, uh, about the deep sea benthic ecology of the Indian Ocean in general and uh, what is the present status if we look at it about the deep sea biodiversity. Mm, if you can, you know, see the progress Ocean is one of the you know, world's most uh, deoxygenated or oxygen minimum zone, particularly the Arabian Sea uh, and Bay of Bengal also, but Arabian Sea specifically. Uh, also, world's second uh, you know uh, largest deposits of the manganese nodules are you know available in the Central Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean, next to the Pacific. And third, also have got uh, around 18,000 kilometer long uh, mid-ocean ridge, which is almost, you know, more than 28% of the global mid-ocean ridge. Now, these, some of the specific areas, plus we have some uh, seamount systems, both of the axis of the ridges and in the, uh, Abyssin plain as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, these are certainly making very attractive habitats for the deep sea life. And also, these are the unique for biological speciation because most of these areas are the stress conditions like OMC, no oxygen minimum zone. The deep sea hydrothermal vent system where temperature and and the uh, abyssal plain, but the food is very limited. And therefore, uh, these are the unique with respect to the survival and also evolutionary perspective. And there are you know, reports that on the regular basis, new species are being discovered from this area. When we talk about these resources, I would specifically thanks some of those, you know, countries presently very active in the Indian Ocean for the deep sea resource mapping. And it is only because of this, some of the mineral resource like the polymeric nodule or hydrothermal vent or the, you know, sulfides uh, and the cobalt crust. Because almost 30 years back, uh, there were very few players other than India to invest in the deep sea research in the Indian Ocean because there was no specific attraction. Deep sea study itself is a very expensive affair. And unless you have some attraction, nobody will put up the money there because you don't know it is a blind game. But for last almost two decades, many countries are coming forward and doing the research in the Indian Ocean and contributing a lot to the science. And specifically it is, as I can you know, see it, some of those countries which are investigating, looking from the future you know, benefits. Whether it will come or not, time will prove that one. But presently it is helping the science and I am for that. You know, as far as getting new data, we required somebody to, to fund those research programs and that's how it is happened. So with this introduction, I am specifically going to talk about the deep sea macrofauna, neofauna, megafauna, but specifically we'll talk more on the macrofauna. And most of you are aware about it. I have just you know, put up some pictures just to see about the size fractions and just to understand, we have the bacteria or bacterial size forms. We have some forams and neoforma. Then we have, so this is microfauna, we say, or microbenthas, the myobenthas, and these are the 0.5 to 3 centimeter, what we have got, macrobenthas, and bigger than all these things are the megabenthas. So this is how the classification, you know, classical, traditional classification of benthas is you know, followed by the benthic ecologist. When we look at it, you know, we did during the census of marine life program where Mark was, you know, very active and coordinating many programs. We worked together during that time. This is a product of census of marine life where we have worked, looked at the deep sea benthos 
a different fraction and all the data were synthesized together with you know uh, gilbert row and his student uh, worked together we all have supported uh, them with the data and the exercise is you know put up into these two graphs as you can see that there is a you know abundance and biomass and fractions you have bacteria meiofauna macrofauna and megafauna as you can see it you know there is a difference in the pattern if you look at it and the pattern is importantly if you see it the abundance in the form of you know uh, shallow water to deeper water and if you look at it the bacteria you know, as you can see it in this meiofauna macrofauna and megafauna megafauna you have got a large size uh, and therefore individuals are very high in the you know shallow water and this is obviously because you have got more food available in this area although you know the uh, here will be the abundance will be very high in the shallow as you go deeper the abundance is reduced drastically with with you know uh, megafauna if you look if you come to the macro and meiofauna you can see that the abundance is reducing in the deeper water but the graph is not steep as it is in the you know megafauna and as far as the meiofauna if you see it the the picture is still you know very clear that shallow and deeper water the certainly has a lower abundance in the deeper water but not like what is in case of the macro or megafauna and if you look at the second graph here is you know different picture all together in terms of biomass biomass changes very fast with respect to the depth changes in the deeper water but again again more so in terms of megafauna and macrofauna but not for the meiofauna so meiofauna is one which sustain the stress of depth and resource crunch and therefore they are very interesting to study in terms of their ability to use the resources both in shallow and deeper water so this is how it was put up in a global picture we now what we consider you know usually that you know deep sea microbenthas generally considered to be highly diverse but low in abundance as i already mentioned it here then macrobiotic diversity may not be exceptionally high but compared to the shallow water but it is you know certainly high in the abyssal plain and shallow sea uh as far as the diversity of megafauna is concerned it appears to be appears to be it is not it concluded as i understand appears to be high in the uh, rich region or sea mount region because it's specific to that compared to the other areas and this could be because of the resource availability what uh, we have done it you know last almost two or three decades we have sampled indian ocean in different parts for example shallow and coastal waters both in arabian sea and bay of bengal like here is the arabian sea from the shallow almost 20 meter to 3500 meters both Uh, bay of bengal simultaneously also some specific area in detail then the deep sea particularly interest our interest earlier was central india basin we all know that it is the rich area for the you know uh, nodule deposit and future prospects are there for mining prospect then along the ridges we are presently we are working under the india's deep sea mission program on along the ridges and as well as the you know, 
So these are some of the station locations where we have sampled in the shelf region as well as in the abyssal region. And uh, these are some of the you know equipments what we have been you know conventionally using for the deep sea sampling. Like initially we are using you know Van Wyn grab or Peterson grab we came to the you know more precise box scorer. Then we are now using for last couple of years the multi core. Then also we are using the you know, benthic sledge or you know, modified dredge for the you know megafauna sampling, and the, using the standard techniques, the samples are you know, processed. Most of the time, we have used you know the research vessels belong to Ministry of Earth Sciences or the CSI National Institute of Oceanography, or sometimes even the higher uh, you know, charter research vessels are used for collecting the samples. And uh, we collect, as I told you, that you know bulk samples with the box scorer or the Van Wyn Peterson grab, or sometimes with the you know, multi-core subsampling is done this way, as you can see, the core is taken and it's sectioned at each two to five centimeters, sometimes even one centimeter interval for detailed uh, ecological, microbiological, or geochemical studies. Uh, some of those you know, results in brief, as you can see that the composition of the abyssal uh, or deep sea abyssal macrofauna usually in terms of the group i am showing it here we do have the species composition also done and these are some of the you know, major representative of the, the group wise as you can see that most of these are also coming you know a temporary macrofauna because they are permanent meofauna small size like copepores and nematodes but then there are perfect Polychaetes and other organisms. We are permanent macrofauna. So the what what has been recommended in the deep sea studies is that go for the finer size so that you will not miss uh, those fine fractions of the fauna. And therefore, if you use uh, as recommended uh, for the deep sea studies around 300 or smaller uh, mesh sieve, you tend to get it those meofauna. Uh, which are permanent meofauna, even macrofauna. We uh, do it fractioning afterward also, but we don't want to miss anything. So we try to use it as fine mesh as possible. Sometimes even the 200 micron also we have used it, uh, but usually we use 300 micron for macrofauna uh, and 63 to 32 micron for the meofauna. So these are the dominant group, as you can see that in most of the macrofauna, subsediment macrofauna you'll get Polychaetes and crustaceans are the most dominant. And crustaceans, it will sometimes, polychaetes will be the most of the time the dominant one. Crustaceans, sometimes you might get a support amphipod or tanids. Here in the case, we had tanids were there. I support amphipods were there, but not that. Uh, we do get a large size neophoda more than one uh, millimeter, uh, and therefore it is retained on the fine uh, 300 micron, and it has been considered. Although is it, you know, meofauna forms like herpectoda and uh, nematodes do get it in the macrofauna, no, but we have specifically mentioned it very clearly that these are the temporary macrofauna, and this is what it is. Uh, as far as the coastal studies are concerned, we have sampled, as I told you, that both east and west coast very meticulously over 30, 35 years, and. Uh, the different groups of work. I'm very happy to share that there are more than 10 PhD studies, both from CSR uh, NIO as well as Cochin University. And some of those people are doing very well, such as the Jardas, Jairas, uh, who have worked with Dr. Damodharan. Uh, then there's Ganeshan, who worked with Dr. Raman, Sivdas, uh, Sanita Sivdas, Sabya Sachi Sautya. These are the work with NIO, uh, and uh, they are active. You know, I can say third third generation benthic ecologist. You know, we are working quite well, and uh, have come up with very good publications. And uh, those, when we synthesize uh, Sanita Sivdas and myself, we have synthesized the data of what we got in Indian data, and we could see that both east and west coast uh, there are 
typical uh, groups representing each basin and these are the sedimentary basins what we have you know divided based on the sediment characteristics for example on west coast we have you know kutch or you know uh, then kutch mumbai basin then you have a kokan basin then you do have it you know kaveri basin kg basin which are well known in commercially also as far as the you know oil and natural gas is concerned and then you you do have it you know manadi basin and these are sedimentary basin depending on the and also the composition of these forms uh, specifically the macrofauna composition of this a dominant group in in this particular exercise we have seen it where the polychaetes uh, and bivalves and gastropods uh, or 1400 species of gastropods are reported in different literature belong to 142 families and or uh, 400 genera and these are most of the data is from the obs so it is data is curated we can definitely see because either it is from phd this is all the published papers and so geo referencing for all the data was checked and found it and therefore uh, by walls we had around 582 species to be figure could be more because this is published in 2016 so uh, polychaetes as i was just telling you know one of the dominant group or 565 species uh, are reported in along the both india east and west coast so there are three most dominant group we have polychaetes bivalves and gastropods in terms of the speciation uh, as far as the resources are there as, as as i was telling that arabian sea is one of the you know uh, largest omc area and therefore oxygen is the limiting factor then the food as far as the deep sea forms are there certainly is both in the form of shallow water you have the chlorophyll you know flux coming from the you know, surface also there are you know seasonal fluxes so we do have it you know, as you can see that in this graph you do get the chlorophyll even in the deeper water and uh, dissolved oxygen as as you can see it the depth wise profile Uh, in the arabian sea and uh, are shown it in, the, in the, this one well uh, if you can see it uh, in this graph we have the structures of you know, size fraction we have you know seen it both in shallow and deeper waters uh, and here you, you can see that you have uh, larger forms you know particularly percentage of the larger or mid size forms was in the mid depth between 500 and the 1500 meter water depth you do have smaller fraction in shallow water as well as in deeper water so this is the one which you know mostly in the slope region self and slope region you have got you know medium or average size macrobenthic species you do get it uh if you look at it the species or you know not all the species are identified because as i as i was telling that the this is like ongoing studies are there and as and when you get the experts available for different families or group it will be you know updated and is being done very well so at the genus or family level as you can see the polychaet in the deep sea what you get it are you know presented here then you have uh, nematodes then you do have it uh, tanids and herpetoa and copepods they are four dominant groups in the in the form of macrofauna nematode is in the uh, neofauna and we have got that also very well this is uh, we try to see how diverse these forms are there with respect to the specific site uh, locations which we have been sampling in central indian base uh, basin regularly for last almost 30 years and when we say seasonal variation when we visit it on yearly basis there is not much variation as far as the uh, uh, abundance uh, is concerned but biomass we have seen there is a variation and it could be largely because of the availability of the food resources in the regions uh, there are some species particularly in the in the stress areas and uh, in the 
oxygen minimum zone what we have seen so hypoxic condition areas there are you know for example polychaete species one of the most dominant was the parapinus pinnata but we do have it other species present there and specific adaptations of these species to the low oxygen conditions are they enlarge their branchias to uh, probably to store the oxygen when there is a you know high oxygen present in the area and then afterward uh, use that oxygen when there is a low oxygen condition that's how they adapted to the conditions and survive when other species cannot survive they have the rich food resources but oxygen is very low and therefore they utilize that conditions and pro pro for their self you know population increase or prolification so these are some of the adaptations these these species do have it what we have i i just mentioned it you know in the first slide for the global picture as you can see for the central indian uh, basin both in terms of density and biomass and this is how it changes with respect to the you know depth so we have 3000 meter mostly the deeper water i'm talking about because that's the depth we get it when you go deeper waters more than 3000 to 6500 meter and you have the density of macrobenthos per meter square and here is the biomass you know gram per meter square and as you can see that you know we do have it around the you know 5000 meter where you have uh, quite a good uh, observation because these are the areas where are more sampling has been done but otherwise if you can see that as resources get limited the density and biomass also reduces that's what but you do have some patches and this is where you can see it we have the you know uh, abundance of macrofauna here and here is your longitude your latitude and there are some patches where you do have it very high abundances uh, in the uh, central indian basin so what is important here is the your you know food and here we have got the you know carbon and here is the you know aloeum uh, concentration so chlorophyll and uh, uh, aloeum concentration how do they match it so seasonally available flux is the major food for the deep sea uh, life in this area so that seasonality is very uh, uh, clear in some of the both shelf and the uh, slope area Uh, that's what we have concluded is i was just talking about the different you know species uh, what we have seen and the distribution uh, in the deep sea particularly in the central indian ocean as you can see that from the 10 degree south to the 16 17 degree south uh, we have sampled repetitively in this area and here are the distribution or biogeographic distribution some of the species of polychaetes are shown it here tanids a distribution is shown it here and herpetoid copepods are shown it here so there are the patches as i was telling that where you have high diversity you know in some of the areas there is one reason i could say it that why we have got high diversity in this region is we have more samples in this region so we can't say that this is only the high diversity zone you do required more sampling in some of other areas to make it the you know uh, conclusion that these are the only areas where you have high diversity and this could be the sampling you know uh, bias because we could sample more we have got more species which is also known that in deep sea if you get more sample it tend to have or uh, result into the more species uh, as far as the uh, um, surface distribution or the horizontal distribution i showed it in previous slide here at some of the sites where we have repeated sampling we also have seen the vertical distribution of benthos particularly macrobenthos in the sediment and it was specifically for the purpose as i told in the beginning only this was part of the our environmental study for the polypetalic nodule future mining program and therefore we wanted to also see that if nodules are available Uh, vertically in the sediment, how deep they are, and what type of life is associated with that if it is there, and therefore the vertical distribution we have studied up to 50 centimeter samples were taken, even deeper also we are taken, but we have seen it the fauna present up to 40 centimeter, maybe you know the fraction of 
that percentage may be very low, maybe five to less than ten percent below ten to fifteen centimeter. However, it is present in that area. As you can see that particularly from this graph, you have got five, five, five. So around you know twenty percent it comes below twenty or fifteen centimeter, whereas eighty percent is above. And particularly top ten centimeter, you have got almost seventy to eighty percent of the. But now so the top ten centimeter sediment layer. is active as far as the benthic activity is concerned and that is the most important from the biodiversity point of view and that should be considered for more you know detailed study because if you take deeper sediment core it is a time consuming and you will not yield more more than 10% of the uh, what you get it in the surface 5 to 10 cm well uh i already mentioned you that we also work in the shelf and slope region and the deep sea region both east and west coast and there are some results we uh, i have tried to put it just for the, the, the uh, you know example here we took a two transect uh, one was of uh, between karwar and mangalore and one was you know of ratnagiri and uh, there were more transect about this was in detail we have taken it from shallow to deeper water and went from 43 meter water depth to 3500 meter water depth and uh, what we have seen it that it was across the oxygen minimum zone area so we do have it self region representing slope region and basin representing all the three what uh, habitat you get it along the west coast of india and as you can see that the depth between 500 meter and 1000 Uh, 500 meter was the oxygen minimum zone, and in that area we do have that comes in the slope region, and we do have it very low abundance in this area, high abundance in the shallow, and then also in the deeper water. And as you can see, that biomass was the maximum in the shallower zone, less than 500 meter, very low biomass in the OMZ area or oxygen minimum zone area, and then there is. Little bit increase in the deeper waters. Now, if you look at the representation of the fauna or composition of the fauna across the you know uh, water depth, you can see polychaetes are the most dominant, followed by the crustaceans, and that's what you know. And then there are other forms. The most dominant are polychaetes, almost eighty percent, and then crustaceans, mostly isopod and pipod and tanids. And depending upon the location, it will be five to ten percent, almost eighty percent, the polychaete. so highest uh, uh, abundance around 3700 was in the self region uh, around you know 100 meter water depth lowest was in the basin around 3000 meter water depth almost 10 10% as compared to the you know, shallower so that's the range of abundance what we have got it uh, as far as the uh, abundance is concerned and even the biomass is also comparable the same way highest in the shallower region and low in the deeper waters uh, as i was telling you that uh, you know there are you know very clear uh, correlations with the food resources although there are the patches as i told you that uh, with respect to abundance and biomass in the entire basin area if you look at it so here are the biomass there are some patches here you have and this Uh, not directly related, but yes, you do have it correlation with respect to the, uh, the the abundance and food availability. Food availability in the deeper water, organic carbon, but the flux what we get it in in uh, in the form of the marine snow or the particle flux from the surface productivity. Uh, and this is how it, it it works in the shallow water. We have done some you know seasonal experiment. and uh, we will try to just explain how it could be connected with the deeper water also so we do have it seasonal primary productivity in the surface water or the shallow water or even in the intertidal water very rich chlorophyll you know uh, production and that's form into the form of the blooming what we get it you know phytoplankton blooms sometimes and if the blooms are consumed by the surface or uh, you know uh, pelagic fishery Uh, if not then it will the uh, you know uh, flux in the form of you know sink down 
marines do or in the form of and then get deposited at the bottom and where you will get it this is a core which is collected in the around 500 700 meter water depth where you can see the freshly deposited cream color uh you know phytoplanktons are available here so this is how it is made available for and we did the experiment of ratnagiri uh seasonal you know, three different cruises we did it and three seasons we did the sampling we already published this data uh in 2014 and where we have uh, seen it that we do have it you know uh seasonal primary productivity dissolved nutrient then upwelling takes place the area so there is a Uh, a large primary production takes place in the sink in the form of bloom the we have done the measurements and this is the in the form of so here is the rich microphytobenthos at the bottom and if this is a food for the uh, you know all other forms available in the sediment but here is a food for the zooplankton and then the benthic larval stages uh, uh, are you know in the sediment water interface because it is in shallow water then you have high organic carbon present here and that's will with the microphytobenthos organic carbon you get in a support with the large demersal fishery and this was coincided with very clearly because you have microphytobenthos we have high chlorophyll contain the sediment and tom and here is the blooming of the benthic polychaete which is almost 80% of the all benthic biomass and abundance was the periphylopsis uh, pinnata and which is a form for the Uh, demersal fish larvae in that area so this is how it was again correlated with the you know demersal fishery simultaneously conducted in the area and we concluded that the seasonal uh, blooming not only uh, uh, phytoplankton blooming not only support the pelagic fishery but it will be also followed by the demersal fishery maybe delayed by month or 45 to 50 days but it will support also the demersal fishery in the area so this is what we you know reported in that one uh, so i am coming to the probably you know last few slides so how is the deep sea indian ocean having high number of species uh, community dominated by few species as i told you that specially adapted to the deep sea environment community include many rare species i'll just show you some of those thing most of the species are not known because Uh, expertise as i told the genus level species level only few species we have uh, been identified and we are trying to uh, identify and we are welcome we, anybody is willing to you know put their time and expertise for we do have the material available with us so deep sea indian ocean is a treasure for the new discoveries we already have reported couple of this new spawn species beetle star species and there are new records in from this area presently we are collecting a large number of the megabenthic species from the uh, uh, mid atlantic uh, mid mid uh, indian ocean mid uh, ocean ridge areas both from central indian and southwest indian ridge areas and those are some of the forms uh, what we are recently collected I, i can show you some of these are not yet identified some of the identified tentatively so we do have sponges including the carnivorous sponges So he is a dragon fish, very rare one. You have the sea anemone, and and the echinoderms. There are dozen of different species not yet identified. We do have crustaceans, uh, scott lobsters, deep sea fishes, shrimps uh, from these regions. Uh, also, you know, as you know that uh, these are some of the area are uh, unique. As I was just telling you that so. Uh, this is the first time it was reported from the indian ocean this scallyfoot gastropod which has direct you know uh, association with the mineral deposit in the or hydrothermal sulfide deposits in along the indian uh, both central and the southwest indian ridge and this is the one species which is endemic to the uh, indian ocean so far has not been reported from other areas but in indian ocean the distribution is quite wide from south to north uh, since it has direct association with the hydrothermal vent the scientists are um, also speculating that if something happens in future in terms of deep sea mining this species could be the first one which will be uh, exposed 
to the commercial activity and what happens to the species we don't know after that so this is what at present because not much information available on this except on the biology uh, even on ecology not much is known about uh, this species because newly discovered so distribution of some of those rare uh, rarely occurring species like for example hard coral or cup coral we have got do you have tunicate deep sea i'm talking talking about you know the barnacles goose barnacles deep sea goose barnacles um, see anemone i told you dragon fish some of those undulated shrimps and this is how they are central indian uh, reach as well as the southwest indian reach from where we are collected but they could be available from uh, available uh, along the other areas also that's what the genetical studies preliminary results indicate that they are some of them certainly like uh, you know barnacles or the corals uh, and some of the shrimps like they are widely distributed they are some novel species as i told you that could be the new species to the science but some more studies are required we are in the process of uh, identifying both using the traditional morphological tools as well as the molecular tools and hopefully in couple of months we'll be able to come out with few new species in the form of publications okay uh, so future strategies what is required for such studies that we need to do more sampling to account the species present in the area identify the species which are specific to the habitat so keystone species for that particular hairy habitat be it the sea mount be it the self or slope or the in the basal plate because there are certain species which are dominant and they are you know uh, adapted to those conditions so we need to identify those species from those areas so that it will help as uh, you know previously you know uh, experts was telling about the marine protected area so if there are specific areas there are already talk about preserving some of these areas as a marine protected areas and if we know that what species are specific to what area then we will be able to you know uh, put some of the management practices to conserve those species uh, effectively okay uh, i have something to share because uh, my friend uh, today brought to my notice that uh, there is a new publication just came in nature just yesterday it is out and it looks like that it is very important and pertinent to the present uh, my presentation because they say that if you are looking for the climate solution protect the marine or protect the you need to protect the ocean and particularly protect the sea bed because what they say that the the finding says that if you do more trawling at the deep sea or or the or, or the sea bed there is every chance that you are releasing more carbon which is not a friendly for the climate so what does it means if there are marine protected areas or if the if you can reduce the trawling there will be less pressure or the effect of climate change could be reduced i'm not sure how it will be how, but certainly the physical activity it will if it can be controlled it will help in preserving the biodiversity at those areas that that is what i can you know say it thank you very much for your attention